the most interesting guests in the music industry, entertainment, art, and politics, step into the studio for Turning Point with Frank McKay. This week on Turning Point with Frank McKay, Frank talks with Eric Bloom of the legendary rock band Blue Oyster Cult. Since their 1972 debut release, Blue Oyster Cult has sold almost 25 million albums. The interview highlights the emergence of the band as a major force in the arena rock era. Let's listen. And now, Turning Point with Frank McKay. Welcome to Turning Point. Our very special guest today is Eric Bloom from the band Blue Oyster Cult. And they have been a legend for 40 years uh, in the music world. And certainly uh, listeners that are, uh, that are in the tri-state area should know that uh, BOC is a uh, homegrown product. Eric, how are you? Doing quite excellent. How about you guys? We're doing great. Yes, the band started... Um Around 1967, if you want to find the exact seminal point, um, on Long Island, around the Stony Brook University area. And you guys were originally uh, called uh, Blue Oyster Cult? Well, there were several other names first. I think the original uh, name, which lasted a couple of years, was Soft White Underbelly. Then from there, it moved on to the Stock Forest Group, uh, which actually had a record contract with Electra Records. And then it became uh, Blue Oyster Cult in uh, late 71, early 72. I grew up in this area, and I know Swift White on Underbelly was, uh, uh, was a pseudonym of yours also. You would go out into clubs under that name to either work. Yes, yep. that's true. Uh, we went back and used the name a couple of times to go. Uh, I think we played my father's place under Swift White Underbelly, but, of course, that place is long gone. Yeah, it was a legendary place in, in Long Island, that's for sure. Uh, as far as uh, as far as soft white underbelly, it was there a reason for that. Uh, was it just to keep the crowds down, or was it? Well, at the time we were uh, headlining coliseums, so uh, it was just a way to maybe try out some songs, or or just do a, a quick, uh, you know, try some songs out, or you know, just like um, I went to see that Joan Rivers movie about two years ago, and it was very similar the way comedians work and the way rock bands work. You know, uh, Joan Rivers, who could certainly headline a, a big place, you know, used to go into little comedy clubs and try out jokes. Yeah. So uh, we did the same thing, maybe try out some new material or, or, or whatever. Also, it, it, you, you tend to get the hardcore fans, which is also a lot of fun. Let's go way back. Let's go, let's go to 67 when you're starting out as soft white underbelly. Who do you meet? How does the band form? Give us the, the history, if you would. Well, that's a little before I joined the band. Uh, actually, April of '69. Uh, so, but I do know the history in general, just from having been close to it. Um, I think uh, Donald, uh, who is now called Buck Dharma, and uh, a bunch of other guys used to jam at a house, uh, which they called the House on the Hill, in uh, out by Setauket, somewhere near Stony Brook, and. Um, uh, for your listeners who are not in the tri-state area, Stony Brook is a state university on the uh, north shore of Long Island in Suffolk County. And um, Sandy Perlman uh, had been the student body president there, and he had gone on to graduate school, but he still lived in the area in Smithtown. And he had connections because he was the co-editor of Crawdaddy Magazine, which was one of the first um, maybe rock-only type magazines. And uh, matter of fact, his co-editor um, was John Landau, who um, I think is still Springsteen's manager. I might be wrong, though. Yeah, well, he's a legend, John Landau. And right, that's well, right. Perlman and Landau started that magazine together. And uh, Sandy um, had these connections through the magazine. And he heard, you know, some guys were jamming there and went in there one night and saw this just guys jamming. And... Um, said, you know, I really like what you guys are doing, and uh, I don't even think they thought of themselves as a band because different people would just walk in and sit down and play. And um, he is the one that laid the soft white underbelly on them uh, for a name, and he got that from Winston Churchill, who uh, named Italy the soft white underbelly of Europe during World War II. Mm. And... Um, uh, Donald was uh, one of the guys, and there were a variety of other guys there. And um, he really liked his guitar playing. And uh, Donald had been in a band with Albert Bouchard in college at Clarkson University. And um, I think they needed a more steady drummer. So Donald suggested, well, I used to play with this guy in college. So Albert was in Chicago doing something else. So 
somebody borrowed a Volvo from somebody and uh, drove out to Chicago, picked Albert up, and brought him back to be the drummer. I think the car lasted right to the uh, right to the Fifty Ninth Street Bridge, is as far as it got. <clears throat> and then, um, then different people were in and out. There was a sax player for a little while. Uh, there was a different guitar player, rhythm guy, a, a variety of different people, and it was very loose. And um, it's uh, Donald also suggested he had a friend who would, who was a folk guitar player that was learning to play bass, Andrew Winters. So they got him to play bass. And um, a guy named Les Bronstein, uh, who I had gone to college with, as a coincidence, hmm. uh, at Hobart College in upstate New York, uh, he had graduated uh, and was just hanging out in that area and came into jam one night and just started uh, making up lyrics while the band played. So uh, he was uh, coaxed into being the lead singer. And then, um, let's see, uh, I think that's it. Yeah. You know? And when did you when did you come along in '69? You mentioned. Uh, yeah. Well, um, Perlman got the band to record some stuff, and uh, with some demos, I guess he convinced Jack Holtzman to sign the band. He really liked the band as sort of a next doors kind of thing, and uh, he had also had um, Holtzman uh, had the doors on Electro Records. So um, it's funny that that's where it started. That, I mean, judging from where you guys went musically, where you went, uh, that it started out as a, as another Doors. It's interesting. Well, only because I think um, he thought Les could be a, a Morrison-like character, and uh, the music was kind of West Coast also at the time. You know, they were very influenced by um, by um, Airplane and um, you know West Coast music at that time. And uh, uh, a lot of jamming, like uh, Grateful Dead, and uh, and um, uh, also uh, Quicksilver, and bands like that. Yeah. So um, they uh, had this material, and um, uh, as Underbelly, uh, they got this deal with um, uh, Elektra, and then uh, they got an advance uh, on their contract and came into Sam Ash to in Hempstead to buy equipment, and I was the salesman. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I had been um, playing in upstate New York for years and, and different cover bands uh, yeah. with a little bit of original material, but, but mostly just covers, just playing fraternity parties, local bars, you know, anything we could get. And um, I graduated in 67 and then um, moved back down to Long Island, and uh, I was actually... Uh, moved down to New York to start as a agent with a premier talent agency and um, didn't think I'd really ever be in a band again. And the, the deal with, um, with uh, premier fizzled after I moved. So I was kind of left uh, with no employment and I thought I had a definite job. And um, so uh, I walked into Sam Ash and it's, you know, they knew me cause I'd bought gear there and uh gave me a job as a salesman, and I was there maybe 10 days when the underbelly walked in to buy equipment. We're speaking with Eric Bloom of the legendary band Blue Oyster Cult. Eric, you mentioned a couple of uh, a couple of pre-cult jobs that you had. And, uh, Premier, is that what, uh, Barcelona? Was that Frank Barcelona? Yeah, Frank Barcelona and uh, Barbara Skydell, and uh, May She Rest in Peace, and, and uh, uh, Mike Martineau, and uh, a variety of other, you know, uh, they they had the who they had you know real uh, sure. real big bands and uh, they were one of the top two or three main booking agencies of that era and uh, I was hired as a trainee to um, start working with the agent on the Crazy World of Arthur Brown and sure. um, and uh, Brian Auger uh, and Julie Driscoll. What was and your re- oh, what they was couldn't get, they couldn't get a visa so my job went away. Ah. What At was least re- that's what I was told. It could have been <laughs> bullshitting me. Yeah. What was the relationship uh, between you and Barcelona like? Uh, I, I really worked with with uh, with Barbara. Um, they hired me in, in those days. Very often, record companies, agencies would work with um, people who did similar things in college. So they would have um, sort of like let the college be the internship, yeah. and then um, uh, move move right into uh, the pro ranks of, of, of either working for a label or an agency. Um, when that job fizzled, by the way, um, 
I, uh, it's funny, I've told this to a few of the uh, top agents there, if they're old enough to remember. <laughs> I, I applied also, uh, when that didn't work out, to the William Morris Agency, and they did offer me a job. Um, but they said um, it was, I, I'm trying to remember, it was like $75 a week. Mm. And if that sounds like nothing today, it really wasn't much back then either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, that was a trainee program where they would send you out and go to secretarial school. Uh, so you could learn shorthand and you would start as an assistant to an agent and learn the business from the bottom up. So I really couldn't afford to take a job for that little um, because the job would be in New York City and you couldn't get an apartment you know, for all of that added together, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was impossible. You couldn't live, you couldn't eat. So I didn't, I said, you know, how does anybody do this? And he said, well, you know, we don't care. You know, that's the offer. So uh, I passed on that. And that's when I took the Sam Ash job. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting background. And, and I think you've been uh, given the reputation or you earned the reputation of being pretty good on the business end uh, of it too. You got a good business mind. And, and, you know, from what I hear and, I imagine that that comes from, uh, you know, learning the hard way, having jobs other than just uh, rock and and music. Well, yeah, I, you know, when I was in college, you know, the you know the entire my, my college band was called Lost and Found. I had I had a few other bands, but the the main one was called Lost and Found. And um, uh, I was the our agent. I was our prom- promotion guy. I mean, there was no you know it was college guys. Yeah. So. Um, what was your major? Uh, romance languages, believe it or not. Oh, jeez, yeah, that'll yeah. That, that'll get you get you far as in the job <laughs> world, right? Well, you never know, but uh, it was um, it's handy uh, on tour. Well, how did it do with uh, you know? I shouldn't laugh. How did, you know, a lot of your a lot of your music is uh, is is yeah, considered very well written from you know the lyric standpoint. Did uh, did it help you musically your your college background? Well, in a way, uh, only because. Um, uh, I find, you know, when I think of lead singers that I respect and, and know, um, very often they have a very good ear. That's why you can hear a good lead singer, you know, change, change it, be good with an accent yeah. or be good with uh, a foreign language. It's just, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe something in, in, that, in your head. And uh, a guy like Ronnie Dio, another guy who was uh, a giant. The late great. Yeah. And he, you know, he... He would hang out with British guys, and he would affect a British accent unknown to himself. Mm. You know, and um, you know he would say "Tom mate," you know, stuff like that. Just yeah. he didn't even realize he was doing it because he was like a chameleon. You know, he could just absorb any accent or, or any kind of style. I mean, I saw Ronnie. I mean, we could do a whole other story about um, Ronnie Dio, and, yeah. and I'd be willing to do that because I was a huge fan of his. I, I'd love to. I, you and me both. Turning point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. I saw the two of you together on the uh, back, you know, back to back on Black and Blue. Oh, you're that old? Yeah, I'm 45. <laughs> uh, 45. I could, uh, I could, you know, I could write a book on that. But yeah, well, you know, I just find a lot of lead singers, you know, started from a bar, ba- bar band background, and uh, when you do that, you have to be, you know, you have to sing Mick Jagger, you have to sing uh, Paul Rogers, you have to sing, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You got to cover all the bases. So um, it's good training. Yeah. But it comes from, you know, having a good ear. And I I found that, um, you know, languages came easy to me and I I always stunk at math and it was just one or the other. It was like yin and yang. Yeah. So the, um, uh, when we toured Japan, I went to uh, Berlitz uh, school for 60 intensive hours of Japanese before I left. And uh, did the and all the asides and stories during the shows in Japan and Japanese, and um, uh, also uh, I would do the same in uh, even in Finland or uh, in uh, Germany. Just um, you know, I would I would write it out phonetically and have a cheat sheet on the floor. But it was, you know, I I worked on the accent and getting it right. How about Buck and? and- uh, and Albert and the rest of the guys, uh, did they go to these classes with you, or is that something no? It was uh, you know I'm the front man. You know, yeah. it's, you know, you know. I know I'm not the world's greatest singer, but you know I feel like I'm a decent front man. Hey, you've you've done pretty well for yourself. But I was going to say the uh, the other guys, as far as learning the other languages, you didn't. Um, well, no, you know that's you know I I believe God gives with one hand and takes away with another. So yeah. you know Buck is like one of the world's greatest guitar players. 
So, you know, he's got that. Yeah, right. <laughs> you don't have to, right, he doesn't have to learn the, uh, the accents and yeah. everything else. Uh, what about your first big tour once you got uh, together with the band and, uh, and you joined the band? You went from, from Sam Ash to the band. What was the first big tour you did after that? Well, there was a few steps in between, but... Um, well, go, let's st- start from... Uh, st- no, uh, uh, you know, this is a long, moldy old story from 40-something years ago. So, but, but to make a long story short, you know, um, the, the band... Um, oh, God, it's too long a story to tell. But they, they got in touch with me uh, after we met at Sam Ash, and, and they had a gig at the Electric Circus, which was on St. Mark's Place in the city yep. in 1968. And, and I had a van and I had a PA from my bar band days. So they said, the sound here is no good. Could you come down and do the sound for us? So I did. And, I, uh, you know, we all got high together and just partied our asses off, yeah. etc. cetera. And they, um, Perlman came over to me after the show. And, you know, I had the van and I had the PA. <laughs> that was probably a good part of it. Yeah, good start. And, um uh, asked if I wanted to move into the band house and uh, work with the band. So uh, I, at that time, I was crashing at my sister's house, and I'm sh- I was uh, glad to move to um, the band house. Unfortunately, there was no, no room in the band house. It was in Great Neck. Mm. And uh, so the only thing they had, um, there was an attic, and Alan had, uh, oh, we, let, we left Lanier out before. I knew there was something yeah. I didn't cover. Um Alan was one of the guys jamming in that house as well. And um, we, we may have to go back and tell that story again. We can do a part two and a part three. There's a, yeah. 40 years is a lot of time to cover in a half hour. Yeah, so. yeah, so to make a long story short, Alan lived at the top of the attic, and Andrew, uh, the original bass player, he lived at the top of the attic, and the only thing was there was a couch between the two rooms in the, in the hall. Mm. So I slept on the couch in the hall in the attic. Now, and um, until um, Les Bronstein was let go, they, uh, unknown to me during the uh, Electra re- recording time, uh, he was sort of wigging out, apparently. You know, I was not privy to, to the inside band politics at the time. And um, they asked him to leave mm. uh, right in the middle of recording. So uh, Perlman came up to me in the, in the living room and said, you know, the boys want to talk to you. And I went down to the basement where they rehearsed, and they asked me to, uh, you know, to be the vocalist. Hmm. Now, uh, unknown to me was one time uh, the band had a gig in upstate New York, and Alan and I drove the, the actually it was my van, but the band uh, appropriated it, drove up to upstate New York to do a gig at Wells College, which is um, in upstate New York. And um, while I was visiting an, an ex of mine up there, Alan was crashing with some of my friends at school and he heard some tapes of my bar band days and told the other guys that he liked my voice and thought it would be uh, a good fit. So he told the other guys about these tapes he heard and that was how uh, I got my foot in the door. We are with Eric Bloom, lead singer from Lois to Cult, celebrating 40 years of, uh, of rock music and Doing all types of uh, doing all types of things. Still, you guys are in the middle of a, a career here. You're not, you know, you're not done yet. Well, we have uh, we have some ideas for uh, for recording and and, and different things uh, coming up. Some interesting little uh, projects we hope. And um, of course, uh, this being the 40th uh, official year since the first album came out in '72, um, 2012 has been. Um, an interesting time, especially in the last uh, last uh, time period here, last month, uh, we had the hurricane in New York right in the middle of a few of our gigs, and uh, so it cast a big monkey wrench into uh, all our plans. But uh, we had a very interesting show. We we uh, rehearsed for three days and um, came up with an entire set of acoustic material. That, uh, we did our first acoustic ever show at the um, Landmark uh, Theater in Port Washington. That's also on Long Island for those listening. Out yes. Of so oh. it's on the, also on the north shore of Long Island, but in Nassau County, and it's a it's an old school. Uh, it's a large schoolhouse, um, like a big brick building, and uh, the town converted it from a school into a multi-purpose. 
um, social center, etc., and the uh, school auditorium was converted into a really nice 420 seat or so um, uh, sort of a boutique uh, venue for um, for sort of artsy craftsy acts like uh, jazz singers or a folk act or or bands like us doing a, all acoustic. Certainly, something a little different. It was different, but you know the songs came out so interesting, just to, you know, uh, and and different, just by sort of jamming on them with acoustic instruments. And our drummer Jules um, came up with a variety of percussion instruments because he does a lot of percussion on the side when yeah. we're not working. And um, so it uh, it came out really, really. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, first of all, just the change of pace was fun. Hey, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? We are not. Yeah, has anybody contacted you about that? No. Uh, how how do they keep somebody like Ploister called out of the Rock and Roll Hall well, of Fame? Well, they, they just nominated Rush, so, you know, um, we certainly would not get there before them. Yeah, right, that's true. You, uh, But they started uh, they started a little after you, right? I well, think they some... used to open for us. Yeah, no kidding, that's interesting. Oh, yeah, so did, so did just about every big band you could mention. <laughs> give us a give us a quick list of of people who have opened for Blue Eyes to Cult. Uh, Aerosmith, mm. uh, Rush, um, probably REO, uh, Styx. Um, geez, uh, just on and on. Amazing, you know? yeah, that's amazing. All you had to do is open for us. You got big. Who did? Well, I said well, that's all you had to do. Yeah, right. Open for you guys. Oh, a uh, Kiss. Kiss. Uh, well, their, first, their first show ever, they were uh, they opened for us. That, yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Let's let's talk about that for a second. Uh, some people, you know, we've spoken to you know all the guys in Kiss over the years, uh, but it, it, so much was made of them playing smaller venues and having the fake crates, you know, having the fake uh, stacks, the Marshall stacks. When they were opening for you, do you remember anything like that, or were they their fully equipment? I don't remember with their equipment, but. Um, they they had the makeup and they had their moves and the boots and you know and the outfits, and they were the opening act and they had a bigger truck than we did. Wow. Um, uh, they had you know, I don't know pyro and I think a Gene's hair caught on fire at the show. No kidding. Yeah. Where, and, was, where was the show? Um, the Palladium. Oh no on, kidding. F- on Fourteenth Street. Yeah. Oh, well, Which that's. Was also, yeah. It was called. Uh, I think there's. A, if you go to uh, Facebook, there's a picture of it on my Facebook page. Oh, that's interesting. That'd be an interesting. Uh, you know. Uh, somewhere, somewhere in there, somebody uh, posted a photograph of it. Uh, my friend Harold Black, uh, who was in Teenage Lust, um, he, I think, one of his friends sent him a picture, and he sent it to me. Uh, the billing was Blue Oyster called Iggy Pop, Teenage Lust. And Kiss was not even on the marquee, mm. and they were added as a fourth opening act. Oh wow! Um, and um, it's a good gig for them, though. Back then, it was a great gig for them. Yeah, well, uh, they, it was a pivotal gig for them. And then, um, you know, of course, they their uh, shtick, shall we say, you know, caught on, and um, you know, they became huge. How do you like the business? And I, and I mean business, like underlying business. I don't mean the music business in general, but how do you like the Behind the scenes stuff. What do you mean? Oh, the agent work, the managerial work. Do you like that part of it? Well, I don't have much to do with it. That's why you have an agent and a manager. Yeah, but you you don't like the. I mean, you started out a premier and you. Yeah, like a, well, uh, you, you know, know, I never really got my feet wet in it. You know, but uh, you know, I sort of was a jack of all trades before I started doing that because, you know, when you, I was calling agencies when I was a college kid and and booking other bands. And um, I arranged, you know, concerts, and I did sound for for um, the concerts that came to my school because the school, you know, the student committee type of kids, you know, who didn't know anything about how to make a show be good. You know, I used to just. I remember one one instance where um, I think Richie Havens was playing where 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 I was uh, at Hobart, and. Um, they set up the sound so the it was kind of feedback no matter what they did and it was terrible so uh, i just walked up out of the bleachers and, and walked straight down there and of course there's applause you know mm. oh, oh bloom will take care of this because i was a big man on a small campus <laughs> right and also i had you know huge hair and 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 I was just kind of an eyesore to the uh, to the <laughs> campus and um i 
talked to uh, you know whoever from the administration was there and, and to Richie Havens. I said, you know, let's take about a 20 minute break. I'll bring my PA in, and it'll work. And um, you know, I just ran down to uh, I think my apartment and got got the stuff and set it up really fast. And of course, it worked because no one else was qualified to make something sound good. And um, it worked perfectly. And uh, from then on, they sort of always consulted me when they wanted to do anything. So um, it, it was it was it was kind of an interesting time. What was what was the turning point in your career, or if you prefer, what was the turning point in Bloys to Colts' career? Well, certainly in my career would be uh, several different things. And uh, you know, I do believe that the right place at the right time, or fate, or whatever you want to call it, but. Obviously, that Sam Ash job um, just was a complete coincidence, and I, w- I wouldn't be on the phone today if it wasn't for that. Yeah. Then um, we also did a um, a um, audition for Clive Davis um, at Columbia um, when we were trying to get a deal, and we had failed a, a few times getting deals, and um, uh, someone at Columbia Records um, got us on audition with Clive, and um, I guess everybody, all well, your listeners, know who he is through through uh, American Idol. You know, he's a he's. Um, I would hope before American Idol, people would know who Clive. Well, Davis was. you know, I don't think the layman would know. Yeah, but but the the you know he's a giant in the industry, and uh, we did an audition at the Columbia uh, Records building on Fifty uh, Second Street and Sixth Avenue, and um, inside of a conference room. And instead of coming to see us at a venue, he wanted us to play right in the building in a conference room. Hmm. So that was a little bizarre. Yeah, you know, and um, we set up against a short wall and played towards the other short wall. And there was about eight chairs at the other side of the room. And we did a five-song set. And um, it was um, Patti Smith was dating Alan at the time. And she didn't have a deal yet, I don't think. And... Um, she was there, Bobby Columbia, who was the uh, drummer in Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Um, Harry Nilsson, another guy to rest in peace. Yeah. Um, and Clive and some A&R guys were there. And um, it was a uh, five-song set. And Harry Nilsson got up around the second song and left the room. And I figured we were screwed. Wow. And uh, he came back about halfway through the next song. And when the audition was over, why did you get up and leave? He says, I, I needed a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we're going to get hauled out for a couple of songs. I- <laughs> yeah. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. What, what was that? It, you know, just give me an idea. I mean, were people clapping in between the songs? Or I, they- I don't know. I was just, we were just doing the best we could. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're in a room with, 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 you know, fluorescent lights. You yeah, know? right. And and all we did was they the room they, like half the lights were turned on and half were off, and it's a a, a, moon, a room where you would have a long uh, you know business meeting. Yeah. You know, and they took the table and chairs out and just we just set up and played. I, I asked you about your first big tour, but let me ask you something else. What you remember your first big paycheck coming from the band? Uh, I think a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Not not big money back then, right? Uh, we were an opening act. Yeah, you know, uh, we were on uh, as far as the economics uh, went. We were on a very small salary, and um, we had to get from place to place on our own. We we didn't fly; we couldn't afford to fly. So um, we had a band house out in Dix Hills in those days, and um, and then we moved from there to another band house in Eaton's Neck. And Again, I, these are Long Island places. Yes, those and then I. Um, I used to rent a 12-foot box in Huntington, and um, um, we would. There was a Hertz rent a car on the corner of um, of uh, Jericho Turnpike, I think, and and um, and uh, 110, and it was. Um, we used to get a Fury Three. Remember, this is the about 1972-3. And we'd get a big four-door sedan, and we'd rent a 12-foot box and uh, get all our gear in there. And we had, I think, one friend that was the whole crew. Mm. And we would go, and we would do all the driving ourselves and all the, um, uh, you know, all the schlepping ourselves, everything. Now, how long did that go on for? You know, a few years. Yeah. And, you know, when Rush opened for us, they were all in a van with all their equipment. 
Jeez. You know, it was, it was uh, um, they had one crew guy, the three guys in the band, and uh, and they were all rode in a van with their equipment, and, you know, they were in the same sort of situation we were. Was Neil Parton in the band at that point? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I imagine that's an interesting uh, group of guys. We can do a whole other view on that. Oh uh, uh, yeah, we we uh, the very very nice guys and very down to earth, and and uh, I'm very happy for all their success. I imagine very bright guys too. Yeah, they're, they're just you know, they don't really have airs. You know, they're yeah. regular people, and uh, and uh, we used to have a lot of fun together. Uh, back in the day. Just a reminder, we're with Eric Bloom, lead vocalist from Blue Eyes to Cult. They're celebrating in 2012, 40 years since their first album's been out. Uh, have you done a book? And pardon my ignorance on that question. Have you, no, no, I haven't. Uh, have you been approached about something like that? Uh, not really. Have I you, mean, there are BOC books out there that... that uh, yeah, but I mean you personally, did you? <clears throat> no, I, I don't know if I... It would be tough to write. Yeah. Because, you know, how far do you really want to hang out all the dirty laundry, you know? And I, I don't really... Well, I didn't mean that. Didn't mean... No, you know, uh, it, that's, where all the, that's where all the juice is, though, is, is you know, all the... Yeah. The, the infighting, and that's what people want to read about. They want to hear, you know, they don't want to read about it. And then we put out this record, and this song was a hit, and, and then we went to this studio. I mean, that's kind of dry stuff. I, I guess so, but I'm talking more in 40 years... The, the people that you've come across, uh, the change in the business, too. I mean, you've gone from, uh, you know, talking about playing in, in, in Man, uh, Manhattan during, you know, getting high before the gig in the 60s and then record deals in 1972. And now, I mean, Yeah, I guess there's some people it would be interesting, but I, I just think that, uh, that um, you know, the real book would be, have to be written from uh, right, right. You know, what really happened and, and, uh, and to who and how. And um, I just really would, I don't think I would ever write a book like that. How about any changes? I mean, looking back, uh, I'm sure all of us would change things, but is there any any specific uh, segment of, of your career that you would have changed if you could have? Well, sure. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's a phrase in our business, you know, that eventually gravity sets in. And, uh, you know, it happened to us in the mid-'80s. You know, we had a good run yeah. from 71 or so up to uh, 84 or so. And um, then all of a sudden the tickets, you know, for big venues stopped selling and um, records, you know, were not moving. And uh, we just had to face the reality that uh, the 70s were over and um, different kind of music was popular and uh, things changed. Yeah, MTV really wasn't your thing. You well, know. we did a couple of videos, but we were not, you know, uh, glamour pusses, that's for sure. Yeah, well, you, you were more, you know, arena rock. I mean, arena rock was your, your strength, and uh, seeing the band live and, and um, you know, that type of thing was where you guys really took off. You know, once uh, once arena rock dies, then, you know, uh, the plastic gets in there and, the you know, the video clips and the sound bites and all of that. But also, you know, hair bands came in. Yeah. And uh, disco came in, and punk came in, and it was all, you know, things changed. Yeah. And, um, you know, we weren't about to chase that. So um, we had uh, a couple of bad years, and then um, some people came left, and some people came back, and, you know, it reformed, um, I would say, about 87 or 8. And we got some good offers to get back to work, and things have been on the slow rise up ever since. What do you go from here? Um, more of the same, you know. Uh, I'll just knock wood, you know, that um, you know people still want to come see us and, and enjoy what we do and um, like the songs. And we did put out um, a couple of newer records uh, a few years ago, and. Um, which I think are very good, but unfortunately the public is just not too aware of them because they weren't publicized. Uh, an album called uh, Heaven Forbid and another one called The Curse of the Hidden Mirror, which are not on uh, Sony. And I guess they can be found if people sniff around for them, but there are a lot of good songs on them. Yeah, well, people should get them. Where can you? Where can they tune in to hear some of your old uh, material? Do you well, have... a lot of our stuff is on YouTube. Um, uh, I guess obviously iTunes is is the main place these days to uh, download songs, but uh, a lot of our stuff is on YouTube. That people have brought a camera to a show or um, 
or or literally just you know they show an album cover and just play the song. Yeah. So it's easy to hear this stuff. And w- what about a website? You want to plug a website or something? Uh, BlueOysterCult.com has all our gigs. Um, and uh, my site is ericbloom.net. Uh, there's a buckdarmer.com. Uh, there's richiecastellano.com, julesrudino.com. Uh, Kasim Sultan has a website, but I'm guessing it's kasimsultan.com. And uh, it's... Um, you know the band right now is 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 pretty smoking. You know, uh, of course, Kasim is our bass player. Just uh, took over from Rudy Sarzo, mm. and um, he is uh, you know so well known from Utopia, and uh, he was in Meatloaf the last ten years, and he was bass player for Joan Jett. Oh, he's he, had a career. What you know? Oh, yeah, rivals he, anything. He was, he was in the New Cars. Uh, he's done done. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of his, and the fact that he wants to play with us is just great. I you used to go watch. Uh, they did um, a long time ago. They did a, um, a tour back to the bars, mm. and um, I'm, uh, I've always been a big Todd fan. Yeah, so uh, no I saw the original Utopia many many times. Uh, one of my favorite bands of all time. You and me both on both of those uh, yeah. on both of those fronts. Our special guest today has been Eric Bloom, lead singer of Blois to Called. Eric, congratulations on what's a great career. Uh, very few people have a career like you guys have had, and it's still going. And everybody, check out Blois to Called dot com. Eric, thanks for being here. Glad to uh, glad to chat with you. And uh, if you ever want to do uh, you know pieces about some of those other things we talked about, you know, I saw Ronnie Dio, you know, when he was playing bars. Yeah. So uh, Elf, probably right. You probably be- before Elf. No kidding. Two steps before Elf. <laughs> wow. It was a uh, Ronnie Dio and the Prophets. The late great Ronnie Dio. That that's that's a whole other interview. Let's let's be in touch and let's get together soon, Eric. Okay. Great. And again, <laughs> congratulations on the forty years. Thank you very much, and thank you for tuning into Turning Point. Turning Point with Frank McKay is brought to you by Herman Katz, Cam, Jenny, and Klein, Duffy and Duffy, and Gold Coast Bank. Turning Point with Frank McKay was produced by Out of the Box Studios in Bohemia, New York. Executive producers Frank McKay and Harry Oates. Director of Operations Corey Arnold. Audio and Studio Engineering Francis Kazmarek. And James DeZigo of Sage Studios. Webmaster Eric Stoll. Radio segment producer James DeZigo. Hotel and accommodations provided by Ohiga Castle Hotel and Estates in Huntington, New York. Transportation services provided by Mark of Elegance Limousine in Hop Hog, New York. Catering services. Services provided by Windows on the Lake in Ronkonkoma, New York.